Thank you for attending a Levy Library drop-in mini session. Today we're going to talk um, about building a search. Um, so the idea of just kind of thinking about your information need, where you're going to go, and um, kind of constructing a search, and uh, maybe what, how that process will look different in different um, in different kind of contexts. So to introduce myself, my name is Samantha Walsh. Um, I'm a librarian at the Levy Library and kind of what I'm going to go through today is a big part of what I do when I meet with people one on one. Uh, so if this is something that you think you could use one on one help with in terms of maybe a specific project, uh, please reach out to the library. You can always email me directly or email the library um, via our website uh, to request an appointment. Uh, we're doing all of that via Zoom. Uh, for you know the foreseeable future. Uh, so like I kind of hinted at, uh, when we're thinking about literature searching, it's really important to kind of think about our steps. Um, so it's really important to not just kind of jump to uh, PubMed or wherever else it is that we're going to search. Uh, PubMed is great, I spend all my time there, um, but there are times where we don't necessarily always wanna use just PubMed or maybe even PubMed at all. And so that's why it's really important to kind of step back and think about our information need, think about how much information we need um, and you know what types of information make the most sense for what we're doing. Um, and then we're going to kind of think about, okay, well, then what am I going to use? You know, if I'm looking for data, is PubMed the place to go? Probably not. Um, or if I'm looking for, you know, background information about something, also probably not the place to go. Um, and then, you know, once we do to kind of decide where we're going to go, whether it's one or more, um, you know, databases or repositories, thinking about our information need and thinking about, um, you know, kind of how, um, whatever we're looking for is likely described in the literature and using um, keywords to kind of use the resource and search effectively, which is kind of the, the biggest bulk of what we'll be doing today. Um, and then we will not be talking about using a reference manager today, but I think it is absolutely, you know, kind of the last step in effective literature searching is documenting your search and saving whatever it is you find so that you don't have to, you know, make yourself crazy and go back again. Uh, so I'll end our poll and I'll show you guys what everyone said. Uh, so we were pretty across the board with the with our participants in um, why we search, but then it seems like everyone goes to PubMed. Uh, so that is the, our kind of main place where we're going to be looking at today. Um, but it's really important to remember that it's not just PubMed. In most cases, we do want to search more than one source. Um, and the reason for that is different databases have different content, different subject coverage, different subject coverage, and different functionality. So when we're talking about content, it's really important to remember that some databases um, include different types of content. So they'll include journal articles along with multimedia and um, you know textbook chapters and maybe even data sets, whereas some databases are only journal articles. Articles. Some databases will have journal articles and conference abstracts. So it's important to kind of think like, okay, how is the information I'm interested in published and where will I find it? And especially where will I not find it? Um, and then different subject coverage. Um, so PubMed is an awesome biomedical clinical database. But if whatever we're searching for maybe veers into, you know, legal or business or psychology, social work, even like healthcare administration, um, it would be, it's very, very useful to kind of bring ourselves out of like the PubMed bubble. So a little bit um, in a minute or two, we'll think about, um, you know, subject specific databases, because of course, PubMed is not the only subject specific database in the world. Um, but we'll also talk about tools like Scopus, Web of Science and Google Scholar uh, that can be really useful for kind of uh, doing that like initial breaking out of the PubMed bubble um, and kind of seeing like where that other literature is for our search. Um, and finally, difference in functionality. So for example, there are filters in PubMed that um, allow us to kind of, uh, you know, sort by the age of participants in a study. And, you know, if it's published in a nursing journal, obviously non-medical databases have totally different filters and totally different functionalities. So there's also kind of different things we can do um, in terms of, you know, filtering and, you know, kind of how we can search. Uh, so 
like I said, we are focusing mostly on PubMed today. And so I think it's really important to step back and think about what is PubMed. Um, and so PubMed is a biomedical database that makes Medline available. Um, Medline is, a, is an index or, you know, kind of just a collection of biomedical journal citations that the National Library of Medicine in some form or another has been gathering for decades. Um, you know, it, it has taken different names and PubMed is basically the way that Medline is available on the internet for free. Um, and so what's important to remember about PubMed and Medline is that it's not a library. Um, it's an index of citations that we can search. We can search the title and the abstract and the mesh terms, which is something we'll get into in a minute, but we're never searching the full text. And just because we find something on PubMed doesn't always mean we have access to the full text. But I actually think that's really great because what it does is it allows us to search completely across publishers for free. So it's a very, um, it really kind of brings biomedical literature, you know, even if it's not always completely available to us, it at least um, for free lets us know um, what's out there and lets us search across publishers without going to different platforms. Um, and so if you ever read a systematic review or an article that reports on its search strategy, and if it says it searches Medline PubMed or Medline Ovid or Medline EBSCO, that's just because it's possible to search the Medline collection on different databases. Um, but PubMed is the, the most popular and the freely available uh, way to search uh, Medline. And then PubMed Central is the, you know, obviously 6 million is not a small number, but in, you know, when we're thinking in context here, it is the much, much smaller collection of freely available, um, freely available work, um, typically work that has been funded by um, NIH funding. And so it's being made freely available to the public within PMC. And so anything that's in PMC will always come up in a PubMed search. Uh, so any questions at this stage about PubMed and kind of like what it is? Okay, so um, I am going to actually take us out to PubMed for a little, oh, actually, no. First, we are going to think about search syntax. Um, so sorry, I apologize for jumping around in my slides. Um, but when we're thinking about search syntax, we want to think about um, we want to think about how we're combining our terms. Uh, we're rarely searching for just kind of like one concept on its own. Maybe when we're beginning a search, but when we're really kind of coming up with like a lit review and we're looking for stuff, we're typically looking for, you know, kind of like studies or literature that addresses kind of like a few topics together. Um, and so the way that we do that is we use Boolean operators. I think a lot of us thought that kind of like Boolean operators are over or, um, you know, databases do them automatically. But using and and or to construct our searches, um, I'm not a big fan of not, but using and and or to construct our searches can really help us come up with like a targeted search strategy as opposed to having to kind of conduct multiple searches. Uh, so for example, what I have down, what I'm showing down here is a situation where I'm looking for articles that address hormone therapy, potentially estrogen therapy for heart disease or hypertension. Um, and so I basically want to tell whatever database I'm searching that, okay, I need therapy, I need hormone or estrogen, and I also need heart disease or hypertension to be addressed somewhere in the title or abstract of this article. And I say title or abstract because most, most databases search basically the title and abstract. Uh, there are some databases that search the full text, but to be honest, I wouldn't even recommend searching the full text of articles. Um, I really recommend focusing on the title, abstract, and keywords of an article for searching. Um, and so we're thinking, okay, I'm, I know that, you know, some articles will say estrogen therapy, some articles will say hormone therapy. So I'm going to expand that 
that section, that pillar of my search with, with hormone or estrogen, but I need therapy in there. Um, you know, I could expand a little bit and say like therapy or treatment or management. Um, and then I know that, you know, authors might refer to heart disease or they might refer to hypertension. Both of those would be relevant for, you know, whatever it is that I'm searching for here. Um, and what's important to do is kind of think of these as pillars or buckets. Um, I prefer the word pillars. I have a colleague that always says buckets, but basically you want to kind of think like, okay, I'm thinking of these as like, I need these three buckets. And so if any buckets um, are containing more than one word, so if, if any of my buckets are using the or, then I need to just make sure that I'm enclosing them in the parentheses. And so if we think about it, like what kind of my, my diagram has up here, I'm creating a Venn diagram of three topics here. So if, you know, I have like hormone or estrogen, therapy, and then a third, a third circle for heart disease or hypertension. And I'm looking for only where those meet. And most databases, pretty much all databases will kind of read that and um, give me what I want as long as I'm careful with my parentheses here. Um, and so again, if I'm not being clear, please interrupt me. Um, and so I think my example here makes it a little bit more clear. Uh, so let's say I'm kind of starting off and I'm like, I want to do a literature review or maybe I'm kind of interested in seeing where the literature is on post-stroke depression. Obviously, that's a pretty simple search. Um, and I'd probably, if I was going to write a literature review or, you know, conduct my own study and I'm starting to do research for it, I would probably have like a third arm of that, you know, like post-stroke depression and antidepressants or something or management or, you know, like rates or something like that. Um, but for the purposes of this presentation, let's think, okay, I'm, th I'm looking at post-stroke depression. And so the first thing I want to think about is how are people describing describing what I'm describing here. So I'm calling it post-stroke depression, but I might be interested in an article that says, um, you know, brain hemorrhage and, you know, like, like successive depressive symptoms or something like that. And so I need to kind of start to term harvest and think about what are other terms that might be used because I don't want to miss things just because I'm not using the same phrases and words as other people. Um, and so what I want to do is kind of within my buckets that I've already, my buckets or pillars that I've already determined, I want to think about what are some other phrases that people might use. And so going into PubMed or, or Google Scholar or anywhere and searching post-stroke depression um, is very is going to get me a lot less than going in and searching, you know, this kind of like large search that I've come up with um, down here because I'm including so much more. Um, and so I think, uh, I don't think, I know that coming up with a comprehensive search is kind of a balance between the two. It's, you know, kind of creating this search, but then it's also potentially going through the results and maybe sometimes like, you know, pairing back a bit. Um, and so we're going to go into PubMed and take a look, but I also want to kind of point out before I forget that there's a few things we want to think about in addition to our um, keywords. We want to think about subject headings. So I explained that when we're searching with keywords, we're, th we're thinking about like, okay, what are the words that people are using in their title or abstract? Um, and, you know, sometimes they're author supplied keywords, but we also want to think, okay, in a lot of these databases, terms are added, subject headings are added by the indexers at the, you know, whoever, you know, in the case of PubMed, who are working for the National Library of Medicine. What are those, um, what are those subject headings and how can I figure out what they are and how can I include them in my search? And we also want to think about our search fields. So there might be a case where, you know, this search is just getting me so, so much and I really just need to pare down but I just, there's no other way for me to do it besides saying, okay, I'm not searching the title abstract anymore. I'm saying I only want these words in the title. So we also want to kind of think about our search fields and how we can use those to our advantage. Um, so going to go out to PubMed here. And so I'm starting on the Levy Library website as everyone should, uh, because we have our PubMed link here. And we always wanna make sure that we're going through the Levy Library website so that we have access to all of the full text articles that we pay for. Um, so I'm gonna start off actually just with that, um, with that simple search, post-stroke depression. And I want to point out, so we're going to kind of think more, uh, we're going to think kind of PubMed specific here. What is PubMed doing specifically to my search? Um, 
and it's kind of doing it's doing some of this work for us. So if I was in Google Scholar or maybe a less you know sophisticated website, um, I would be thinking about all of this. But with PubMed, I can start to let PubMed do that work for me. So I searched post-stroke depression. If I click advanced. And then so here's my search and under details, if I click this little arrow. So I searched post stroke depression, but what PubMed searched was this whole guy. Um, so basically what PubMed tries to do is it tries to read whatever I type in and map it to mesh headings. And then sometimes based on those mesh headings actually search other keywords. So where we have all fields here, it's searching all of the fields in the PubMed record. So, you know, title, author's name, author's affiliation, journal name, abstract, everything. And then it's mapping to a mesh term where it's searching for articles that are tagged with that mesh term. Um, and so that brings in articles that hopefully are potentially using these other terms that we haven't searched yet, but that have been tagged correctly by the indexers at National Library of Medicine. So this is an example of the mapping working really, really well. So if I'm creating a comprehensive search, of course I want to, I want to kind of check these mesh terms and add, um, and add my own keywords, but this is an example where it's working really well. Um, but there are definitely examples where it doesn't always work well. And so that, those are times where it's extra, extra important to kind of do what I'm about to show you. So if we go back to our search results, um, I want to take a look. So the first thing that I do, so my first question is like, okay, what are the mesh terms? Like I've already sat down and term harvested ter of the terms that I can think of, but what are the mesh terms that are relevant to my search? And so what I want to do is click on a relevant article. It doesn't have to be like 100% relevant. It basically just needs to be like, okay, this is a pretty recent article that's very clearly on my topic. And what I want to do is scroll all the way to the bottom and find the mesh terms that were added. Um, not every single article will have mesh terms, uh, but most should. Um, if it's super, super new, it won't because it does take time for them to be added. And so what I see here is that, you know, it, it's pretty cut and dry. Uh, the mesh terms uh, that I'm interested in here are depression, and stroke um, and they even actually have added some subheadings that might be useful to me as well um, you know would i would i want to search stroke complications or stroke psychology or maybe even both uh, but what i'm going to do first is actually take a look at um, the mesh heading itself so if i click on the mesh heading and I can click search in mesh. And this actually brings me to like, you know, like the mesh dictionary basically. And if I click stroke, it will show me all of the subheadings available as well as um, the sub the mesh headings below it. So what's great about mesh headings is they're in this tree structure so that when I search stroke as a mesh heading, I'm getting anything tagged with um, anything below it. Most of the time we want this, but sometimes we don't. So a way to turn this off would be um, restrict, uh, do not include mesh terms found below this term in the mesh hierarchy. Um, but in this case, I'm deciding that I want them. But I actually saw two subheadings that might be useful here. So I'm going to search stroke complications as well as stroke psychology. If I wasn't sure what subheadings made sense or if I didn't want to, um, if I wanted to search articles that were tagged just with stroke without any subheadings, I could just add to search builder stroke as a mesh term and I would get any subheading as well as no subheadings. Um, and then let's say I want to add these to my search builder with or. So I'll click add to search builder and then I can search PubMed. Uh, but what I'm actually going to do first before I click search PubMed is add my keywords. So I'm going to potentially add my, not potentially, I'm going to add my search that I've created here. Um, and so remember we're adding, you know, we're adding more, we're adding like, okay, these or this. So this new search that I'm created, creating is definitely going to get more results than that first one. Um, and so I'll search PubMed, um, but I'm sure you're all thinking you haven't said anything about depression yet. Uh, so what I'm going to do is 
Now, um, another way to search the mesh headings is to actually go to PubMed's main page. Uh, so we don't always have to go kind of like through the back end through a journal article. I can actually on PubMed's main page, click mesh database here under explore. And then I can search depression here. And so I remember I saw, I saw depression as a mesh heading, but now I'm like, oh my goodness, there's a depression mesh heading and then there's depressive disorder. Um, which one do I want? Um, and I'm kind of starting to think maybe I want both um, because you know they, they seem pretty similar to me and I think it's possible that the indexers at National Library of Medicine might tag some relevant articles with one and some with another. So what I can do here is click them both and again, combine with or and then add to search builder and I have them over here. And now I want to do that same thing. I can, I want to search depression or depressive. And so I'm going to just click or and search PubMed. Now I have a super, super big, you know, basically probably everything in PubMed um, addressing depression or any type of depressive state. Um, so now I've created two searches and I want to turn them into a Venn diagram. So I want to go click advanced and I have them here below. So what I can do is just click actions, add query, actions, add with and. So now I'm saying, okay, give me my whole depression search, but only as it combines with my whole stroke search. And so remember, this is gonna have way more results than post-stroke depression because we basically included, or I basically included every keyword I could possibly think about, think of. So now I'm going to click search and yeah, I got, you know, an insane amount of results. So kind of what our, you know, our best bet is to really kind of, um, find, you know, find the happy medium between the two. Um, but of course, like I said, this is a very simple search. So in most cases, I would have kind of like a third or maybe even a fourth arm where I would kind of be thinking like, okay, I want to see, you know, I want to kind of understand what the um, effects of yoga or, you know, like, mindfulness therapy is on, um, is on, you know, post-stroke depression or, you know, a home health aid. Um, so stuff like that. Um, and so I've kind of shown the two extremes here. Uh, one thing I want to point out is, um, is my NCBI up here. Uh, so where we click log in. Uh, so I really, really recommend if you find yourself on PubMed more than, I don't know, just really ever, um, I really recommend making a MyNCBI account. Um, and so it actually always keeps you logged in. Um, so I think I was only logged out just because I recently cleared my history or something. But what you can do is when you do take the time, so let's say I kind of worked with this search, I got it down, I had it kind of, you know, working how I wanted it to work. Once I clicked, once I click uh, create alert, I can actually save this search um, within my PubMed, so let's say I just did like stroke depression, I can save this search. I can say I want emails, but I don't. Um, I can click save and then within my dashboard, I can actually come here and click the search to rerun it. Or if you take a look at my other searches that I have saved, I can see when's the last time I ran it and how many new articles have come into PubMed that fall into my search since then. Uh, so this is a really great way to kind of like keep yourself organized and not um, create more work for yourself. Uh, so to move beyond PubMed in our last five minutes, I want to mention that, like I said earlier, PubMed is not the only subject specific database. Um, if you feel like you are kind of, you know, conducting a search that is, um, that, you know, PubMed isn't kind of the, shouldn't be the be all and end all, I really recommend contacting a librarian. Um, but another useful thing to do is on our website, if you click under browse collections here, if you click databases, uh, the third link under browse collections, what you can do is you can say, okay, I'm, you know, this is kind of a, you know, a psych search and I'm not so familiar with where I should be for the psychology literature. Under all subjects, you can limit to psychology and psychiatry. And then we immediately see like, oh, okay, 
Um, we have, you know, psychiatry online for reference works, ebooks, journals, hmm, that, you know, that sounds interesting, but that doesn't sound like, you know, a place to do a lit review. Then I see, oh, okay, you know, psych info sounds like, you know, exactly what I want. Um, but you can also always uh, contact a librarian for any of those questions. Uh, another trick I have for finding out kind of like where you should be searching is finding a high quality systematic review on, you know, on whatever topic it is and just seeing what databases they searched for that systematic review. Um, so moving on to kind of getting out of the PubMed bubble, because sometimes you don't know, like, okay, is this, is this literature outside of, outside of PubMed or not? Um, and also kind of like, how does this literature connect? Who's citing who? Uh, so I really recommend using a citation index like Scopus or Web of Science. So I'm going to really quickly show you what we can do in Scopus. So back on the library's main page, we have Scopus linked here. Uh, Web of Science, you can click databases and find it there. They're very, very similar databases um, to the point where I'm really just showing you Scopus because it's the one linked on the library's main page. Um, but I recommend checking them both out. Uh, so we have a similar kind of layout to PubMed's advanced search. We have a situation where we can have two or more lines of searching. And we're actually, what I like here is we're actually seeing where we're searching. Uh, so Scopus does not have mesh headings, but we know that we're searching in the title, abstract, and keywords. And like I mentioned earlier, we might, um, you know, if this is a really specific search or if we're getting way too many results, we might want to change that to article title. Um, but let's say I'll do, um, you know, post joke and I'll say depression or depressive and I will search. Uh, so what's different here from PubMed and what's interesting is we have, you know, a pretty similar amount of results, but what's different here is what we can do. So when we look on the side, we don't have any, you know, this isn't a medical database. We don't have, we don't have filters related to, you know, medicine or studies, but what we do have is filters related to kind of like publication. So we see like, okay, who are the big authors in this field? What are the kind of the major subject areas that the journals are coming from? Uh, what type of documents am I getting? So this is important. Conference papers and conference abstracts are included in Scopus and Web of Science where they're not included in PubMed. So for something really emerging, a database like Scopus or Web of Science can be really useful um, because all these conference papers, I know that I'm not getting them in PubMed. Uh, you know, maybe later on when they were published, but you know, that's a different form. But the best, best thing here is when I sort, I can sort by highest cited. So obviously I'm gonna get some older texts and you know, a lot of times we have a bunch of guidelines at the top, but I'm in, for my search, for my results, I'm immediately seeing like, okay, what are the big, big um, papers that people are citing on this topic? And what's really useful is I can very quickly kind of like, if I'm like, okay, wow, this is perfect. This is exactly what I want. And I can tell that this is what people are citing. Um, I can click on the, the articles that cited it, this 796 over here and quickly ser search within those. So I can see like, okay, like what are the really, really new articles and studies on this topic? Or I can search within them for like elderly um, to kind of see like, okay, I'm only looking for articles for my, for my specific patient population. Obviously, I guess with stroke, we're gonna get, most of them are gonna have elderly, um, unfortunately, I guess. Um, so that is kind of how I really recommend diving into your searches. So really before getting started, I really recommend thinking, okay, what do I need? Where, um, where do I need to go? And that may, and in most cases, probably will be multiple places, then spending some time term harvesting, then developing a search that you can actually bring across databases. So you can search in PubMed and then bring that same search to Scopus and you have different filters to play with. Uh, so a big question I get kind of all the time is how do I know when to stop? Like, um, you know, especially with such a big search, it's like, okay, how do I know when to stop? Um, and so all of the points I have here are kind of based on the idea that you want to, you know, you want to find it all. You want to, uh, you want to achieve a high degree of familiarity as I've written. Um, but, and that's, that's great. And if you're, if you're writing a really comprehensive literature review, that's probably the case. 
But that's not always the case. If you are writing, you know, a quick introduction to your study or a quick introduction to a portion of your thesis, do you need a completely comprehensive literature review going decades back in history on a certain topic? No, not at all. Um, so actually spending the time before searching and thinking like, okay, what is my scope? What do I need? What types of studies and how recent do I need them to be can actually help you think like, okay, it's time to stop. Obviously, I haven't read every paper on this topic, but that's fine. Um, but that's okay. And it's, you know, I've kind of like hit my quota of what I said I needed before I even started. Um, so I actually think not getting overloaded and not feeling overwhelmed comes down to spending the time beforehand and thinking about your scope. So I want to make sure everyone knows about our upcoming sessions. We're definitely slowing down for the summer, but we have some great sessions on reference management and our new catalog coming up. And please keep an eye out for our sessions coming up in the fall, which will be kind of focused on authorship and publication. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, you can always email refdesk at mssm.edu or me directly with any questions or any requests for meetings.